I want to introduce Barry Bloom, longtime sports writer, uh, works for MLB.com as their national baseball reporter and columnist, and also a longtime good friend. I want to introduce Barry. Hey, thanks for showing up this morning. It's uh, early. It's great to see everybody. A lot of you, uh, I'm sure some of you at least were out at the ballpark last night and the last couple of nights, and uh, it's been a fun week so far. So we're kind of free-forming it this morning. This panel has uh, changed a few times with the uh, changing of uh, people who could come and go and be on it, but I think you know, we really have a good one and we're uh, basically going to talk about scouting and how uh, front offices have changed over the course of the years. And uh, to my right, we've got three people who represent a couple of different eras in uh, front office work in Major League Baseball. In the middle is uh, Roland Hemond, who's an old friend of Sabre, and to a lot of you guys who come to these conventions really doesn't need any introduction, but let's just say started with the Boston Braves in 1953, so he worked for franchises that are no longer in the cities they were in, all the way up to the Arizona Diamondbacks, who are one of the, uh, the last franchises to be expanded into Major League Baseball in 1998, and Roland has World Series rings to his credit from the 1957 Braves, and he was instrumental in uh, Hank Aaron signing with the Braves. And uh, he also has one with the uh, Diamondbacks in 2001 and also with the uh, White Sox in 2005. He went back to the White Sox for a little bit after uh, inter in the middle of his terms with the, uh, with the Diamondbacks. And then we have uh, Tom Tippett who's the uh, Director of Information for the Boston Red Sox, and he's been integral in this era, 2003 and on, in the shift over in the John Henry administration to a more analytical-based scouting perspective under Theo Epstein and now Ben Charrington with the, uh, with the Red Sox. And he's got his, uh, he took part as a consultant for the 2004 team, and he's, he says he's got his 2007 ring ensconced in a uh, safety deposit box for safekeeping. And then we have uh, Ian Levin, who uh, also worked in baseball analytics for the Mets and now is doing a more broad-based job out of, out, out of international scouting. And I'll, I'll let him explain what happened, what's happened uh, with his job. And the uh, situation with the Mets, well, no World Series rings so far, right? They're coming. They're coming, yeah. okay. <laughs> the, uh, so let's start uh, with uh, Roland, why don't you uh, tell everybody what, what you do right now for the Arizona Diamondbacks as a, as a special assistant to President Derek Hall? Well, I go to the Sabre conventions. <laughs> <laughs> With Derek Hall's blessings, by all means, he uh, recognizes the, that Sabre is a, a great group and you, all of you do a lot to help our game. And we were very happy when Sabre moved from Cleveland to Phoenix so that uh, I have a great association now with Mark Appleman and his, his staff, and uh, we're happy to have them come to Salt River Fields, our spring training camp, and various activities. So anything I can do to help Sabre, I owe a lot to all of you. So it's nice to reciprocate in some manner. So, And I'm learning a lot of the new items that come about. I, you know, I still don't, I have a computer, but I don't know how to handle that. So I have a secretary <laughs> who pulls off the hard copies for me, and I don't have an iPad or whatever you call it. So, uh, but on the other hand, I still keep my ears wide open and listen closely uh, to the new an analyticals. And uh, so we'll get on with the meeting and I'll do a lot of listening. Thank you. Uh, Tom, would you, impart your wisdom on uh, on our audience? Well, I don't know if I have any wisdom to impart, but um, this is, uh, I guess, roughly the 27th anniversary of the first 
Sabre National Convention that I attended. Um, I was at the, at the conference in Evanston, Illinois in 1986, right about the same time that I was getting ready to release the first version of the simulation baseball game that I'd been working on. And so when I was uh, approached yesterday about being on this panel to talk about scouting and front office work, it, it struck me that for the first, I guess, 17 or 18 years of my, my baseball career, my, my job through Diamond Mine Baseball was to try to figure out how to accurately evaluate players so that they would perform accurately in the simulation pretty much the way they do in real life. I did not have access to scouting reports, professional scouts, any of that type of knowledge at the time, so I did the best I could acquiring play-by-play -play data and developing methods for studying that data to try to evaluate outfielder throwing skill, base running skill, various aspects of defensive play, bunting strategies, all sorts of things like that. And it was really interesting when I started to work with the Red Sox in 2003 and finally had access to a, a large body of professional scouting reports, both amateur and pro. And I just, I ate that up. I loved having the, the ability to add that kind of knowledge to the kinds of things that I've been doing for, uh, for almost 20 years up to that point. And part of my job at the Red Sox is to computerize all of our baseball information. I'm in charge of our uh, baseball application, baseball databases, and also uh, our analytical work, trying to add value to all that information that we collect in the information system. So we've computerized over 100,000 scouting reports going back to about 2002. And we can, by computerizing them, we can make them readily available to any users of our information system, but we can also do analy analytical work on the scouting grades that are in there and think about ways that we can blend more statistical-oriented techniques with the, the really good information that's in those scouting reports. So um, if anybody has any questions about that sort of thing, I'll be happy to talk about that in the course of this session. Okay, Ian, uh, I, just like I've known Theo, I'm from San Diego. Uh, actually, I'm from New York, but I worked 20 years in San Diego, so very tied into long-term Padre lore and history. And uh, all, Lucchino and Theo are all out in San Diego, so I, uh, I'm friendly and well aware with uh, you know their backgrounds. And it's kind of the same thing, Ian, uh, I know Sandy Alderson, since he was general manager of the A's, and he had a stint out as CEO out in San Diego uh, not too long ago before he came to the Mets. And Paul DePodesta was the Dodger GM when I first met him. And then he was hired by Sandy as assistant, which was perfect for, for the Padres as they go because he had been let go by the Dodgers with three years to go in his contract. So the, so the Padres picked him up for a small set off, which is kind of the Padre way. But, you look like uh, you, you just were bar mitzvah. Why don't you just uh, <laughs> why don't you tell us uh, what, what what your uh, your duties are with the Mets under these great guys? Yeah, I, I work with Sandy and Paul very closely. Um, you know, I started out in the scouting department in 2007. I worked in the amateur scouting department and I helped oversee uh, our logistics, our player analysis, and, and as well as uh, I went out and scouted players for a few years. And uh, last year, they gave me the opportunity to oversee our analytics department. So uh, with the help of some great people in our office, we, we put together our own in-house analytics platform and we do our, uh, our player evaluation, player analysis through a combination of our scouting reports and our statistical data. And uh, hopefully we can continue to build that to the level uh, something like Tom has over here. But uh, we're working on it and uh, you know, I'm excited for the opportunity to do it. Before we move on to the next question, I just want to interject. Mark had mentioned that he and I go back as friends a long way. Mark Appleman, the great executive director who has taken Sabre a long way in the last couple of years. But just to show you how far we go back, I, I was covering the Padres in 1984, the year they won the National League pennant, lost in the World Series to the Tigers. And it was a chaotic year the whole year. And I was always under the gun with the Padres, talking uh, with them and writing adverse stuff in the papers. And you know, Mark shows up on his first road trip after the All-Star break to St. Louis, Chicago, and uh, it was typical of the, of the way things were split up. And uh, Goose Gossage gets thrown out of a ball game in St. Louis, and we have to go talk to Gossage. We have to go 
talked to the umpire and threw him out, and to Dick Williams, who was the cantankerous manager. And Mark is, the next day he writes his story, I write my story. I don't know, you know, there was a day there was no internet, so I have no idea what Mark wrote. But he comes back off the field the next day, and his face is just completely white. And I go, what happened? Gossage almost hit me in the head with a ball. <laughs> That's how far back we go. So, the, uh, you guys, uh, what I, uh, the first thing I'd like to throw out to you is, you know, we've had an interesting week leading up to the trade deadline, and uh, you know, there's been some deals that your clubs now have been recently involved in, and some that were really big at trade deadline in the past. And I'd like you to go through what the thinking was and how these deals were put together. And why don't you, Tom, start with like what happened this week that put together this three-way deal with the Tigers and the Red Sox that wound up, that wound up with Jake Peavy in a Red Sox uniform? Well, there's not much to tell. We called Chicago and asked for Jake Peavy. They asked for a few low-level prospects, and we said, done. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, but how much of uh, <laughs> no, the analysis of PV did you guys do with his injury, and how, how does everything play into uh, picking a guy like this up? Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, these things, as you probably can imagine, um, take time and involve a lot of people and a lot of different types of thinking. Um, I guess our process that led to the acquisition of Jake Peavy started a few weeks ago when we took stock of where we were mid-season, tried to identify what our biggest needs were in the second half, what our biggest risks were, what, what sort of problems could come along that would undermine this, the uh, somewhat surprising success that we've had this year. Um, so Ben Charrington, the GM, went about that in different ways. He, he called a meeting probably a month before the trade deadline of his top 10 or 12 people, and we just kicked around some things. And then he asked uh, me and Bill James independently to do our own analysis of the team and risk factors going forward and uh, send them directly to him. Uh, he wanted us not to collaborate so that we wouldn't kind of bias each other by that conversation. And emerging from that process was the belief that adding starting pitching depth um, and not just a back of the rotation starter, but a, a premium starter was something that uh, would have a lot of value for the team. Um, we knew we were already missing our number one starter in Clay Buckholz, and the reports, we were getting daily medical reports on his progress, but there's always a lot of uncertainty in uh, how those things are going to progress and when we're going to be able to get him back on the mound and, and whether he would be performing at the same remarkably high level that he, he began the season with. So we identified that as a priority, and then pro scouting got to work and started actively scheduling our pro scouts to make sure we were at all of the, uh, all of the starts of the, of the potential starting pitchers that were on our list of targets for that role. So we, were, we had at least one scout, and I think two, at, uh, at, the, um, at Jake Peavy's starts after he came off the DL, so that we were in a position when we came into the days leading up to the trade deadline to pool all of our resources. Um, we had very current scouting reports, and we had done a, a lot of statistical work. Not a lot different from what we do on a daily basis, frankly, but um, a little bit more targeted on the starting pitcher market. And we had identified him as our top priority. We had also, um, it, in, the, in the days leading up to the deadline, we um, we got access to the medical records so that we were able to, to review, have our doctors review the information that uh, the White Sox had available. So that by the time it came down to actually talking about these players for th those players and various other configurations of a possible deal, we had already done our homework on the scouting side, the analytical side, the medical side, and we had, our pro scouts had worked with, with the people they know in the industry to, uh, to get a feel for his personality, his fit with our clubhouse, and, and a lot of other things like that. So we had a very high level of comfort with this particular player going into the deadline. Now it's just a matter of whether we can structure a deal that makes sense for both sides. Uh, as you can imagine, um, the, the 
negotiation process started with them asking for the moon and us offering very little and kind of gradually working toward the middle. But the, uh, the key to this particular deal, as I see it, is that one of our top pro scouting people uh, was aware that the White Sox really liked Avisail Garcia of the Tigers. And we recognized that with all the biogenesis um, information or non-information out there, that there was a possibility that the Tigers could be in need of a shortstop, and we were particularly deep at that position. And I'm pretty sure it was, it was somebody in pro scouting who said, let's, let's figure out a three-way deal where we get Garcia back from the Tigers and make him the centerpiece of, a, of an offer to the White Sox, and that's eventually how it came together. Um, just kind of tangentially, it was a very, very weird trade deadline this year with the uh, biogenesis story hanging over all of our heads. You know, every single player that we talked about giving up or acquiring, it wasn't openly talked about all that much, but in the back of all of our minds was, you know, what, what's going to happen later this week? Are we going to get some information before the deadline? Is it going to come after the deadline? It, it was this very, very strange force in, in the process this year. Yeah, before I move on to you guys, it begs a couple of questions. Uh, you know, number one, to your point with biogenesis, it seemed that the Tigers, it was important to get Iglesias because Peralta's name has been bandied around and they might need a shortstop for the second half of the season or the last two months of the season if he doesn't appeal and starts uh, serving a suspension. So that's number one, and that added into it. And then secondly, how tough was it for you to give up on a guy like Iglesias because you know, you nurtured him so long, and he finally comes up from the minor leagues and starts hitting in the major leagues almost crazily, where I'm sure even most of your analytic stats wouldn't have shown him jumping from 200 in the minor leagues to 300 in the major leagues over a period of time. Yeah, they're both good questions. I think on the first one, I think um, Dan Dombrowski would have to speak for himself as to his motives for making the trade. but as as, a, as an outsider looking in, I think um, there was some uncertainty about their shortstop with the biogenesis story, and not, not because we know anything. I mean, we're, we don't know any more, or at least through the deadline, we, we don't, didn't know any more than the, anybody else did through the published reports in, on ESPN and the Miami paper and all the other people that have been following that story. But that name had been out there for a while, and we had to at least be aware of that. Um, but we also, our feeling was that the Tigers might be looking for a long-term solution at shortstop as well, because I think their their current shortstop has uh, his con his he might be a free agent after this year, if I'm not mistaken. I think he is, yeah. So um, I I think that it's entirely possible that Biogenesis played only a small role in in that particular player going to that particular team, because that's a position of need for them long-term as well. And to your to your second question, um, I think. Jose Iglesias is a very interesting um, player because it's, it's an unusual background. He's, he's, a, he's a Cuban player who entered pro ball at a, at a high level at a young age, um, performed very well in the field. Nobody ever had any doubts about his ability to play shortstop. He's got some of the quickest, most remarkable hands I've ever seen on a baseball player. It's amazing how quick he can get the ball in and out of his glove and, and, and get some some serious uh, velocity on his throws to wherever he's trying to get the baseball. Um, the big question, of course, everybody knows, is whether he's going to hit or not. And it's very, very interesting to try to project that using purely statistical methods when somebody has an unusual career path. And in addition to that, he also suffered a couple of injuries in his first couple of pro years that limited his playing time and may have affected his performance. And that's a wild card in any statistical analysis, you know, just how much of what we're seeing is his true performance level and how much of that is degraded because of the physical issues he's been dealing with. So we have this performance track record. We have reports um, from our player development people. We have reports from our own scouts who we send in to scout our own players from time to time. And we had to try to blend that all together with a major league performance this year that was quite unusual as well. Um, for a period of about six weeks, everything he hit fell in. 
Every soft ground ball in the infield was just soft enough for him to beat it out by half a step. Every reasonably hard ground ball was between fielders instead of outfielders, and every line drive fell in in front of the outfielders for a, an incredible run. And at one point, he had an in-play batting average over 500 that he had sustained for several weeks. And we all knew that wasn't going to persist. Um, but how do you project where that's going to settle down to? If it settles down to 310 or 315, we have a really, really good player. If it settles down to 270, you know, it's a different, different equation. So um, I guess the bottom line is it, it was an interesting challenge in terms of evaluating the player. But when we went through that process, we we all agreed that we had a really, really good player on our hands who would have a lot of value as a major league shortstop. And it, it wasn't easy to decide to give him up in, in this deal. But in order to get something really valuable, you have to give something really valuable. And in this particular case, we had a fit with the Tigers. And we had a position of strength in our organization where we already had Stephen Drew at the major league level. We had Xander Bogarts coming at AAA. We had uh, Iglesias in that mix, and we also have a, two or three good shortstop prospects in the lower levels of our system, so we felt we had enough depth at that position to, to give up a really good player in order to fill another need for the team for this year. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Roland, uh, I'd just like you to go through, and maybe not specifically the nuts and bolts of the Kennedy trade, but you know, here you have a guy who two years ago won 21 games, and then he sort of lost it. And this year in particular, Ian Kennedy was part of, uh, of a huge bean brawl war in, in, in Los Angeles, which a lot of people are saying now woke up the Dodgers. And the, the, on the day that they had this war, the Diamondbacks were eight and a half games in first place in the National League West, and now they're trailing by about two and a half games, so you're talking about 11-game turnaround. And it, he just never seemed to be able to find the plate, his command, his control, his velocity was off, and it just came to a point where you traded him to the Padres this week for a very good left-handed reliever in Joe Thatcher and a couple of other elements. But could you go through the organization's thinking on their, what was their number one starter and why you would trade him at, at this juncture? Well, you'd have to say he was in a pitching slump. You know, they talk about hitters, be, hitters being in a slump. Sometimes pitchers get into a slump. And after that skirmish in, in Los Angeles, he had a, a long period of time, I guess about 10 starts in which we did not win the game. And early innings, they scored on him, and our offense couldn't pick him up. But in any event, he's a fine young man. We're rooting for him and to, to have a good career. He's, as it's Kevin Towers said, he won 21 and lost four during uh, Kevin Towers' first year with the Diamondbacks, which really helped prestigiously for Kevin and the organization to go on to postseason play. And, uh, but he's also going to a ballpark that's more uh, suited for pitching. The ball doesn't carry as well, I and mean, the fences are farther than they are in, in the Phoenix. So. He, he could turn around and, uh, and haunt us for a long time. But you take those chances. Uh, we needed a setup man, uh, left-handed reliever, and we got a prospect that our people feel can become a fine major league pitcher. So time will tell. And that's what's exciting about being a general manager when you're making trades and trading deadlines. Uh, I remember trading uh, Mike Bodica to the Red Sox and helped them get the postseason. And, uh, and, uh, See, I've got to think who we got in return. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, Kurt Schilling and Steve Finley. And uh, Schilling became more studious about the game and matured. After we traded him to Houston, he was only there one year. And then when I joined the Diamondbacks, we were able to reacquire him and uh, went on to be a, a great pitcher and, and uh, maybe a Hall of Famer in the long run. So you hit periods with players up and down of situations they run through. And uh, so it, uh, I, I enjoyed the analytical part. I wish that I would have had as that much information as you guys can provide. And guys like Tom here, uh, 
when I was a GM. So sometimes, uh, like Kevin Towers used to say, we, we make a deal at, uh, at a cocktail party in the old days, and uh, it took five minutes to close it. And now there's much more to study. Uh, sometimes I get concerned about the analytical side to some extent. I always felt sorry for Grady Little with the Red Sox. If Posada had hit a long drive to center field and the center fielder would have tracked him down, Grady Little might still be managing the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. But the bloop hit, such as Luis Gonzalez had against uh, Rivera in 2001 for the Diamondbacks uh, and, and won a World Series. So I used to tell Tony La Russa, look, don't manage for me, don't manage for the owners, don't manage for the, just for the fans and Harry Carey and whoever. And we were 16 and 24 in 83. And uh, the woes were really out for Tony and myself. And uh, we had a great coaching staff. And uh, Charlie Lau got through to Carlton Fisk to hit balls to all field and not the green monster swing. And uh, we won by 20 games that year. We won uh, 99 or 100 games before it was over and uh, finished 20 games ahead. So, and, but Tony was very smart. and that's extremely intelligent. And when the computers were starting, he said, I'll welcome any information they give me. I'll analyze it, but I'll still have to make my own decisions. So, and he's done very well. Future Hall of Famer, as you will agree, in a 33-year career as a manager. But there was one game, though, that I was trying to fend off the owners. They were getting down on Tony. And Jim Rice was up with a couple of men on. I said, please, please, stay in the ballpark. He, looked, he had a long, high drive to center field, and our center fielder caught it against the fence. And then we got hot and won by 20 games. So Tony's situation might have been entirely different if Rice's ball had left the park. So that's, that's how tough it is to manage. And then also, on the analytical side, sometimes say, Tony, uh, the player's one for 10 against this guy or something. Yeah, but he said, Roland, he hit three ropes they were caught in diving plays and things like that. So there's a lot of luck involved in our game. And when we think we've got it figured out, it comes back to bite you to some extent. So you have to admit the mistakes you make and then learn from them and then gather as much information as you can. Uh, it's, I'm past that stage of needing the information because I'm not the guy that's calling the shots. But uh, Kevin Towers had meetings in Tampa right down the stretch at, uh, we were going to be playing in Tampa, so right at the final trading deadline. And it's going to be interesting. Uh, you know, the Yankees had Kevin, uh, Ian Kennedy himself. They gave him up to us at one time. And then in the Arizona Fall League, actually, is where he was well scouted by our people and turned out to be a great trade at, at that time. Then he comes on to be almost a, tie, uh, a Cy Young Award uh, picture two years ago. So players, have, you're dealing with human beings, and that's the tough part of managing as well as analyzing when the player makes his turn. And a lot of times, it's because you have a great coaching staff. I remember Johnny Sain was a great pitching coach, and he helped players change their style, uh, different grips on the ball, uh, talked Wilbur Wood into being a reliever. when I mean, He had been a reliever and talked him into starting Chuck Tanner, and they convinced him that he could start. Well, he pitched 376 and two-thirds innings the following year. He pitched 25 dimes on two days rest. Today, managers would get fired if they used pitchers in that manner. And Wilbur had a fine career till he got hit by a line drive off the bat of Ronald LaFleur and got a broken kneecap. So, he might still be pitching. He might have been like Hoyt Wilhelm if he didn't have that injury. So I, I don't want to talk too long here. I get carried away. You talk as long as you memories. want, Roland. And You're then the sometimes senior. I have to figure out what decade am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> when you hang around as long as I have, there have been like six They decades. all meld together, right? Pardon? All the decades meld together at some point. Yes, right. they sure do. But to your yeah. point, Roland, uh, two things that I think you did the 2003 Game 7 in the ALCS led to a lot of long-term implications for a lot of people. Sure. Not only that dunk hit by Posada, which I consider to be just as important as Aaron Boone's home run, but you know Grady Little took it in the chops for leaving Pedro in too long, and it wound up costing him his job ultimately. 
and then Boone hurts his knee in the offseason playing basketball, and the Red Sox try to go out and get A-Rod from Texas, and that a labor union shoots that down because of the parceling of the money, and if Boone didn't get hurt, A-Rod doesn't go to the Yankees, and maybe we're not in this situation right now today. And then in your Ian Kennedy trade, which you mentioned, you know, I had, you know, just kidding around because I've got a good relationship with Josh Burns, who was the GM who made that deal under quite some pressure from Ken Kedrick, the owner, because they felt that they needed veterans starting pitching right now to bring them over the top. And this is how deals go backwards. I mean, they traded, uh, it was a three-way deal with the Yankees and the Tigers. And the Diamondbacks traded Scherzer and Sclareth to the Tigers. The Yankees traded uh, Austin Jackson and K to the Tigers, Kennedy to the Yankees, and the Yankees got Granderson. Mm -hmm. But from the Arizona end of this deal, now that Kennedy is gone, they, they got also uh, Jackson, and he, they traded him in the middle of the summer for Daniel Hudson. Hudson's gone through his second Tommy John, Kennedy's gone, and the whole net result with, with uh, Scherza having a 15-1 record with the Tigers is that the only thing left from that trade for the Diamondbacks now is Joe Thatcher. So that's the way, that it's crazy how these things, you know, play out. And so, you know, I texted Josh recently before the All-Star break, and I said, well, how's that Scherzer-Kennedy deal working out for you now? And, I, and really, to his, it, it, you know, really defense, he never wanted to trade Scherzer. He was one of their number, he was one of his first number one draft picks there as general manager, and he was put under pressure by the owner to get rid of him to get a more veteran pitcher in Jackson and a guy who thought he'd be good in the long term or better than Scherzer in Kennedy. So, you know, this is the way these things sometimes all play themselves out. Ian, you were involved in uh, the, uh, I, I would assume back in the deal that long term where you, you guys were deciding, are you going to keep or sign Beltran or are you going to trade him? And this went on for weeks. I remember talking to Sandy about this and he was involved in talks with a number of different teams. And you wind up trading him to the Giants for a kid now, Zach Wheeler, who's one of your component parts as you move forward in your five-year plan to rebuild the franchise. Could you go into, you know, what happened with, with that and, and the part that you played in it? Yeah, sure. Um, it's always interesting when you're dealing with a pending free agent, if you're going to kind of move him at the deadline, if you're going to extend him, how much value does he have for your team the rest of the way? There's a lot of factors uh, to weigh in the decision. So. In, uh, in Beltron's case, we had to go through that process, and ultimately we decided let's let's explore the market, see what potential trades are out there for him. So, you know, you kind of identify the the teams that are most likely to be uh, to need a, a player of that caliber, and the teams most likely to be willing to pay the price that, that you'd like to get back for him. So, we identified a couple of the teams um, that we thought would do it, and it turned out that the Giants seemed to have the most interest. So, you know, they they give. Uh, a list of names that you'd be interested in they, that they would move for him and you know it's, it's a matter of sending your scouts out there to gather as much information as you can on the players that they're willing to give back and uh, run uh, all sorts of uh, analysis statistically performance based analysis on future projection uh, there's a lot of different uh, moving parts involved in the equation um, I think if you, you ask the Giants now if they would make the same deal knowing what Zach Wheeler has become they certainly might do it again because they had the the need for a player that would take them potentially to the next step to bring them back to the World Series. Uh, I think we're happy with how the trade worked out, and uh, obviously in hindsight, maybe they they weren't because it, it didn't help them. But I think you can only make a decision at the time uh, at the time you're in at that moment. The process is more important than the outcome, and, and more important than the results. It just it didn't happen to work out for them. But I think they would continue to to make the same move if. Uh, if the situation came up. And then this year, you know, we had some pieces that were potentially available at the trading deadline that they're pending free agents. A lot of people would mention Marlon Bird as a piece that we could potentially have moved. But you go through the same process uh, for Marlon Bird as you do for uh, Carlos Beltran. You determine how much value he has to you for the remainder of the season, uh, what kind of long-term potential you might have with this player if you were to re-sign him, what teams are in, an, in need for this kind of player, and what kind of return you would get. And ultimately, it was you know, given all the factors, it was decided that we'd be better off holding on to him. Um, but
but it's again, it's about the process and about making a, a decision and the time with the information that you have. Uh, and if you kind of look back in hindsight, like on the Beltron deal, you might make a different decision, but you don't have that information at the time. So uh, every kind of decision with, that a front office would make, whether it's at the trading deadline, in the off season, the amateur draft, all sorts of decisions, it's all about information collecting and processing. Um, the more information you have, the better. And you know, the, one of the things that I get to do especially having a uh, background in scouting is kind of get a feel for all sides of, uh, of the information. So the scouting side of information, the analytics, uh, makeup of players, player personnel, salaries, all sorts of things go into the information. And the more information you have, the better decision you can, you can make. So uh, for us, it's, it's just, it's an information gathering uh, process. And ultimately, uh, many different moving parts are involved in making the decision. And you have to use the information you have to come up with the best decision at the, at the given time. Okay, before we take questions from the audience, I want to throw this one question out to the three of you, since it, it, it's part of the whole makeup of what we're talking about. You know, from the Red Sox end, you're, you're a team that's willing to go out and add a component part because in most years you're running for the playoffs and you might identify one person who's a free agent and uh, you don't have control of beyond the end of the year, but you think he's going to help you get to the top. And the Mets, you've been in, involved in exactly the opposite over the course of time, the last five years, because of the rebuilding of the ball club. And Roland, the Diamondbacks have been in either place. Sometimes they're buyers, sometimes they're sellers. But I'd like to open up just the question to all three of you about this rent a player thing that, that's become a, a big conversation around trade deadline, and really the, the trade deadline to me is, is September 1st, because guys get through waivers, and the biggest trade last year was your trade on August 25th with the Dodgers. So, and all those guys passed through waivers and were able to make the deal. What do you think of this rent-a-player concept uh, as far as uh, additions to your individual teams? Anybody can take it. Tom? Well, I think... Um you know, part of your question had to do with, with who are buyers and who are sellers at the deadline. Um, that, I mean, obviously there are teams that, in lots of different situations, and the, the short run versus the long run trade-off is different for, for everybody depending on the situation they're in. This year, it's clear that we're in the hunt for a playoff spot. If we continue to, to play well, we might put ourselves in position to make a run in October, and we had to seize that opportunity because you can go into the season with a really good team on paper, and things can happen to undermine that season, and it's a little bit tricky to say, yeah, we're going to be really good two years from now, so we're going we're gonna to plan everything around going for it then. Well what if three of your five starting rotation pitchers go down with injuries in, in the span of a month during that season and the whole thing is for naught? So um, last year, we weren't sure whether we were buyers or sellers. Uh, we were three and a half games out of the wild card and there were about 11 teams contending for five spots. And on a day-to-day -day basis, our chances seemed to change a little bit one direction or the other. Um, but I'm not sure it it's a good idea to kind of pigeonhole a team as buyers or sellers. There are a few opportunities every year to make your team better. You can do it at the trade deadline. You can do it in free agency. There are other smaller deals that happen all the time. And I look at the trade deadline as an opportunity to be a buyer and a seller, whatever, whatever it takes to make your organization stronger, uh, either right now or in the future. And if you look back over some of our deadline deals the last two or three years, we, we picked up Mike Avilas, who gave us a year and a half of really good shortstop play for a prospect that we didn't mind giving up. Uh, we, we picked up Craig Breslow at the deadline last year, and we ended up having a miserable season, but he's an important piece of our team this year. So, you know, sometimes the rent-a-player makes sense. It made more sense before when the free agent compensation rules were different. Um, so, you know, there's less of an emphasis now, I think, on getting a guy that can only help you for two months plus the postseason this year. Um, we specifically were looking at players that, to add this year that would also have value beyond this season. And um, we could have gone in a different direction and gone after different starting pitchers than the one we ended up acquiring. But 
Um, I guess the, the main point I wanted to make is when I look at the trade deadline, I try not to pigeonhole my thinking in terms of we're either buying or we're selling. There's lots of opportunities out there to acquire players that will be valuable to you either now or later. And we need to be flexible enough to look at all opportunities. I think, I think the, the biggest change with the trading deadline has been the addition of the second wild card. Uh, you know, back a couple years ago, when uh, prior to the second wild card, there was a, probably a, a finer line between a buyer and a seller. Um, now, many more teams have the opportunity to, to find their way into the playoffs, and many more teams are reluctant to sell off their pieces. Uh, many teams kind of fall in the middle, and it's really kind of changed the marketplace. Uh, it, it's a lot murkier, and some teams are, are looking to buy, but more looking long term, whereas some are, are strictly looking short term. It's, it's definitely impacted the way deals have been made and, uh, and the number of players that are available. Uh, so that's been a, a big change in recent years. Yeah, do you guys, uh, first of all, I was talking with Dave Montgomery, who was in here yesterday, the Phillies president, and uh, he was uh, talking about the fact that the Phillies didn't make any moves. And it, my question was, if you are a seller, quote unquote, ultimately you're going to have to go back out in the market and fill that spot again perhaps with a lesser person or player than you wound up trading at the trade deadline. So why break up component parts of a team? Same thing with the Giants. Suddenly they were sellers, but here's a team that won two World Series in the last three years. You've had a bad season. It happens. Why would you break up the nucleus of the team that won when you're just going to have to rebuild it very quickly? I think I think it's a good point. I mean, there, there's many, like I said, there's many decisions uh, that have to be made. It's not as simple as uh, we're just going to trade this player or, or trade for this player. I think it all goes into how the, the player fits within the team, within that given season and within the long-term uh, um, progression of the team. And sometimes there are factors outside of uh, individual components that are at play as far as uh, uh, keeping momentum going, keeping things going with the team keeping the team going in the right direction. Uh, there are kind of non-objective factors that have to be considered that you want to, you want to keep things going. And considering your point on the extra wild card, which I totally agree, do you think it would be well to just make the trade deadline August 31st when you have playoff rosters to be cemented and you can bring people up from the minor leagues and give the extra time to for everybody to make those decisions as you get closer to the end of the season. Uh, but to your point, uh, yes, but there's also, there is the non-waiver, I'm sorry, the waiver trade, de trade deadline of August 31st where deals can still be made after that Well, I'm point. talking about merging the two, sure. so you just have just one. Just one. So right. It's a good, that's a good thought. I know, you know, I think, I, I think the league might be better served having the deadline move back a little bit. Um, so that's nope. definitely a consideration. Uh, that's a $50 fine from the commissioner, Man, Roland, you know that. I might close a deal here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. My no, don't too. take the call, Roland. Come on. Hey, Terry, you, you get to town? Are you here? <laughs> Roland. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, anyway, let's use this as a natural break. Yes. If anybody has questions to ask these gentlemen, please line up. We've got about another 12 minutes to do it. Good morning and thank you. I guess okay, my question was talk to Mark Appleman my question was mainly for Roland, so now it becomes moot. Yeah, go ahead. Go to the back of the line. A lot of us, um, a lot of us in this room, a lot of us in the room are engaged in trading also, mostly in the fantasy realm. Sure. And obviously our rosters are much smaller because we don't have five squads or six squads of minor league players to consider. But my question is, what's your favorite negotiating tactic? How do you, what's your favorite way of getting the deal you want? Well, since you guys Ask are really it. not involved in the negotiations, right? But if you were, what, 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 would, what, what would it be? I think, oh, Go ahead. you, want, Go you ahead. have an answer? Go ahead. <laughs> I, was, I was just gonna say, I mean, there's a big difference between being an advisor and being the decision maker. Um, as, as the questioner said, we were, Ian and I are not actually involved in the negotiation per se, but sometimes we're in the room while our GM is on his cell phone having that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And I would, I would say that the thing that has struck me the most is patience. Um, you know, the conversation may start four days in advance in the deadline, and sometimes one side or the other has the incentive to try to put an artificial deadline on the conversation. Uh, sometimes they're just trying to spur you to make a move because they think that time is on their side and not your side, or sometimes they think that um, they have three or four things they want to get done before the deadline, and if they can get this one out of the way, they can focus on what else they need to do. Um, so there's a lot of times where a team will say, we want to make this decision. We've got two other teams involved in, in addition to you. We want to make this decision by 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And then 4 o'clock comes and goes, and nothing has happened. And you get to have another round of conversations the next day. Um, I think you can avoid making mistakes if you don't allow yourself to be put into, into a time box if you understand that, well, you may miss an opportunity or two if they're telling the truth, that this is really going to go away at 4 o'clock tomorrow. But much more likely, they're hoping it goes away at 4 o'clock tomorrow because somebody meets their asking price by then. But if they don't, it's a whole new ball game for the next 24 hours. So I think the, the, the key is to understand that it's a, it's a process. And you know, certain ultimatums can be safely ignored because it's more wishful thinking on their part than it is a, a real deadline. So you're saying it's a lot like buying a car because my mother-in-law always tells me when you go in and negotiate, don't walk just once, walk twice. <laughs> X, why don't you introduce, yes. introduce yourself? Uh, Dick Kramer. Uh, Raleigh, uh, you, you guys in, when the White Sox, when you were GM, were pioneers in using computers. Uh, and there's a story you once told me about uh, how you use computers to get a certain shortstop from the San Diego Padres. I wonder if you could recall that. Yeah. Well, I had enlisted our scouts to find us a shortstop, the best shortstop you can find in AAA. And uh, Jerry Krause fell in love with Ozzie Guillen as a player, and uh, Dwayne Schaefer had scouted him in A ball, and we made a deal for Guillen, and uh, I had never seen him. I think the scouts cheated a little bit. They put a little more weight on him in his reports. <laughs> and uh, when he arrived from Venezuela, at, and I went, we were training at Payne Park in Sarasota, I ran down to the clubhouse to meet him, and uh, he was sitting at the trainer's table, Herman Schneider's table, and they were chatting, and he had his baseball pants on, but no top shirt. And when I saw that body, I got scared, because he was built like me. <laughs> so after I greeted him and wished him well and everything, I went back to some of our people and I said, I'm really worried about this trade. I, tra I think we traded for a jockey. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, he uh, was the rookie of the year and had a fine career as, for about 12 years with the, with the White Sox. So uh, Just, so. just uh, I, I th what you told me at one point was, you looked in the computer, you wanted a guy who could hit in the field, and according to your scouting reports that you had in the computer, and that, that was the bottom line. Because uh, once you got him, you weren't sure what you had, as you say. But uh, anyway, that's. OK, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, fine, Richard. Next up, thanks. My name's Bill Woodward. I'm from Seattle. I'm curious, uh, in light of the, uh, the, the moderator here, um, in in our media-rich world, it's your job to tell us what's happening and then to tell us what happened and why. And I'd like to ask you, do you ever find yourself looking at what was described as the process that you just went through and made a deal, and this is what you were thinking, he tells us, and you either say, yeah, that's right, or boy, they didn't get it. I'm curious what it's like to be on the inside and then be told what happened on the inside. And I, I take it from any of you. Well, first I'd like to say apologies for last night to anybody from Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that um, was sincere. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry. <laughs> um, I, I've said to many people over the last few years since I've had the uh, privilege of being in the room during the trade deadline period um, that I am equally struck by two things that are polar opposites of one another. One is how often the, t the press gets a story 
that's absolutely right on the nose, and we have no idea how they got the story. And the other is how often we see things in the press that have no resemblance to the truth whatsoever. I mean, we, we, we had, according to the local press, we had traded Will Middlebrooks to several teams last week, and the deal was virtually done, and none of those things were ever really seriously talked about. So I don't know. I don't know where some of this stuff comes from. You know, maybe it's other teams trying to inflate the value of their players by creating false rumors. Maybe it's media just throwing darts and hoping they end up being right. Maybe it's um, agents trying to promote certain things. You know, there's a lot of people that have a stake in these kinds of things that have some incentive to get certain information, true or false, into the media. But um, sometimes, you know, it's pretty impressive how the media gets things right on the nose, and other times it's like, where did that come from? Yeah, and my experience on this, uh, you know, number one, I think to Tom's point, the agents throw a lot of this out there to particular writers that they're hooked up with who will throw their information into the public, and I'm not going to get into the specific guys, but I think everybody pretty much knows who they are and which agents are tied in with which writers. And from my point of view, I've always been reluctant to report trades unless I actually know for a fact that they're going on, because in my experience, 95% of the time, the trades that are out there that are being reported either are wrong or they were once talked about and they're no longer in the hopper or teams are on to other things. And that's why you get surprised by things so often. Next question. Yeah, uh, David Kaiser from Watertown, Mass. And this question is mainly for my neighbor, although also the gentleman from New York could answer it, because it's about big market teams. It's always seemed to me that if you could combine the player development record of, say, Tampa Bay with the resources of, say, Boston or New York, you could have a real dynasty. And it doesn't happen. Now, reading um, Terry Francona's book and also listening to you, I began to get the sense of why uh, that if you're a big market team that has a history of winning, the pressure to keep winning every year is so great that you're pushed into short-term decisions that militate against having the uh, strongest lineup in the long run or, or building a long-term superior team, which we really haven't had since the Yankees in the late 90s. And I, I just wonder what your comment is on that and, and whether anybody ever would find the courage to, to do that. I, I think it is a challenge of a large market team, especially one that's had a run of success. Um, you might argue the Phillies are in that situation right now. Um, you know, they've been so good for so long that nobody wants to let that go and hit the reset button and start building for the next wave. Um, so there are different markets that we play in for the acquisition of players. There's the amateur draft, there's the international signing market, there's kind of small minor league trades, there's major league trades, there's free agency, and so on and so forth. And in some of those markets, you tend to have to overpay for what you need to fill a short-term need. You might do that in free agency if you have a gaping hole at a position and you need to contend this year. Uh, you might do that uh, in a trade at the deadline if you're in a race and you feel like you need that one or two extra pieces in order to make a real push. And in those situations, the nature of the marketplace is that you usually end up overpaying to some degree. And then there are other parts of the market where the rules of the game are set up to try to distribute the talent evenly, and that provides a, a force that, that mitigates against the, the big market teams winning all the time. And you know the rules have changed in the last few years to encourage more parity, and I think more, more of the smaller and mid-market teams are getting uh, more aggressive about keeping their good young talent, and with revenue sharing and some of the other changes, they're more able to do that. So that if you go back to 10 years ago, the first half of last decade, it was commonplace for seven or eight teams to sell off their best young players at the trade deadline because not only were they about to become free agents, but they were getting into their second or third year of arbitration and getting expensive. And teams like ours that have financial resources could scoop up those players on a regular basis. That's not happening anymore. And I think that's good for the game. It makes it more challenging for the bigger market teams to use their, their money to dominate on a regular basis. It, it forces us all to be smarter. And I think that's a good thing for the game. Thank you. I think we're going to have to uh, wrap this up. Uh, we could keep talking. These gentlemen have given us, I think, some great insight into uh, how front offices work. 
Uh, we've had uh, Tom Tippett here from the Red Sox, Roland Heeman from the Diamondbacks, Ian Levin from the Mets. I'd like to thank you all for being here, and we'll have another great panel coming up. See you later. <laughs>